Hey everyone, DL here, Liberty Dad. So check this out. Today, my co-host and I, Josh Fields, we, we recorded our episode. It was a great episode. I was really excited about getting it published. And then afterward, when, we were, when I was under a time crunch and I didn't have time to redo it, I found out that I only had my audio. So unfortunately, we don't have that episode that's planned. So what I'm doing instead to make sure that I deliver something, I'm actually going to go ahead and publish a, uh, another uh, my issue or my episode from last year, episode number 21, Coronavirus, to snitch or not to snitch. You know, I figured with the vaccine passports and all this conversation along that line that maybe we needed to have another kind of a little explainer, you know, about, uh, about snitching. You know, because I think that that might be coming our way because people are getting pretty antsy about this. So this is a rehash of that particular episode. I hope you enjoy it. There is no video, so I do apologize. Last year was audio only, but I think the video or I think the, uh, the episode is actually still pretty relevant. I'll be back next Monday with another fresh episode. Thanks for being patient. Listen, Jerry, don't think of it as snitching. Think of it as betraying the retarded. We're not asking you to do anything we wouldn't do. Well, then why don't you do it? The Board of Education has very strict guidelines for snaring the retarded. We need confirmation from one of her peers. Why me? Well, you've got these braces. They tend to be drawn to shiny objects. Hi, everybody. So I want to take a moment to talk about Liberty Dad. I also happen to call him a lightweight, okay, and I have said that, so I would like to take that back. He's really not that much of a lightweight. It is not enough to talk about liberty. One must believe it. It is not enough to believe in liberty. One must work at it. It is not enough to work at liberty. One must convince others likewise. Reimagining how we do politics. Welcome to Liberty Dad. Welcome to episode 21 of Liberty Dad Podcast, where we reimagine how we do politics by believing, working, and convincing others to work at Liberty. I'm your host, DL, and today's episode is Coronavirus to Snitch or Not to Snitch. Online, it's easy to say things like snitches get stitches or snitches get ditches or any other phrase intended to dissuade snitching. Today, I'm really going to dig deep on the impact of snitching and offer some guidelines when it's appropriate and why. A quick word. If you like the show, find me on Facebook or on Twitter and let me know what you think. Got a topic you'd like to hear about? Tell me. Maybe you'd rather be more discreet. Send me an email to libertydadpodcast at gmail.com. I hope to hear from listeners and see what you think. Now, let's talk about snitching. Hey everyone, for those new to the show, Liberty represents the message, and Dad represents the delivery. Today, I'm discussing how snitching fits into the message and ways we might consider delivering that message. Let's start with defining what I mean when I say snitching. Snitching is any time one person reports another person to someone of authority. It's that simple. It's always good to make sure people understand exactly what you mean when using a term that may vary in meaning from person to person. Have you been confronted by a Karen lately? Maybe you haven't been confronted. Maybe you are the Karen. Or maybe you're someone who is kind of in between and really doesn't agree with snitching, but you kind of understand that, well, rules are rules. Great, I've got a few tips if you identify as any one of those. This isn't the definitive guide to snitching, but it should be enough to get you by. Of course, the name Karen is simply a fill-in for that stereotypical woman who feels it's necessary to call authorities over violations, also known as Permit Patty, Barbecue Becky, and who knows how many other monikers. And while we see a heavy focus on women names, men can just as easily fit this role. What you're not going to hear is any judgment. Lord knows, social media has that handled way too well. First, what I'm going to do is talk about some issues that I have with snitching. 
Then I'm going to talk about when snitching should be acceptable. And then I'll wrap things up by putting all of that into the context of the current coronavirus pandemic and how it relates to liberty. Now that we have all the appropriate disclaimers and definitions out of the way, let's take a moment to discuss that hook you heard at the beginning. I was researching a skit or a scene from any movie that had an interesting summary on snitching, particularly in light of the coronavirus. The scene you heard comes from a Comedy Central show from back in the very late 90s and early 2000s called Strangers with Candy. You may have recognized the voice as Stephen Colbert. He's playing the role of a teacher who asks a student to spy on another student. Her initial response is that she's not a squealer, and she declines. He then manipulates her in, by threatening to prevent her from going on a school trip. That's where the scene you hear picks up. I personally don't recall this show, and the few clips I did watch to try and get a sense of the show's purpose, they left me kind of confused. But that one clip stood out for three reasons I find snitching to be problematic. One, authority often seeks to get others to do their job. Two, they manipulate people if necessary. And three, by doing so, it generates suspicion and discord between people. Let's start with the first one. On my page, on Liberty Dad page on Facebook, I made a post requesting people send me examples of other people snitching. I got zero replies. Though I did get back word that my post was technically asking people to snitch on the snitches. Maybe that's why I didn't get any responses. What I was looking for was how widespread the issue really is. But if you've been online participating in conversations about the coronavirus and social distancing rules, or you've been watching the news, you're likely already aware. I've seen a number of comments from people wanting to know what number they can call to report others, and then I've seen in several states and cities that they have provided numbers and even mobile apps to report people. Elected officials have even went on record thanking people and broadcasting their request that Americans report other Americans. But here's the thing. That's not your job. Imagine for a moment I'm cruising down the road, jamming to some music, and going a bit too fast. Then I see those red and blue lights in my rearview mirror. I pull over, and the officer tells me he clocked me at 80 miles an hour in a 65 mile per hour zone. He then hands me a ticket and I'm on my way again. If instead of paying the fine, I choose to go to court, maybe to ask the judge for extra time to pay, the officer is most likely, but not guaranteed, to show up. If he doesn't show, I might get the ticket dismissed. But assume that instead of going and asking the judge for an extension to pay, instead I decide I want to challenge maybe the radar's accuracy which, by the way, I actually tried once. Now, I have to prove that the radar was not working correctly or maybe that it was miscalibrated. The officer then can provide the date and the time that it was last calibrated, and the judge can decide if my claim is valid or not. Now, what does this have to do with you, Joe Citizen, seeing a group of people allegedly not engaging in social distancing, snapping a picture, and sending it to a number or an app? It removes many mechanisms in our system to help provide proper finding of guilt. We call this due process. In that simple story, we have an officer who is specifically looking for people speeding. And to assist, he's using calibrated equipment to determine when someone is speeding and when they are not. And should it go to court, it becomes my word against the officers and the equipment. Furthermore, when I go to court, the person accusing me of the crime is generally present. And before a judge, I have the opportunity to, to defend myself and dispute my accuser's account. To my knowledge, none of that is present with Joe Citizen. But let's add a twist to that story. Let's say the officer pulls me over and asks where I am heading so fast. And imagine I tell him, Officer, I'm really sorry. My wife is pregnant and called me to meet her at the hospital because she is about to deliver. I'm just trying to get there to see the birth of my first child. The officer could offer me an escort to get to the hospital in order to see 
the birth of my first child. But does Joe Citizen do any of that? Before reporting people, do they inquire why someone may not be observing social distance? Do they have equipment or anything that helps identify a lack of social distancing as strong evidence? More than just their word? Likely not so much. Okay, they might have a picture, but as you've seen probably on Facebook or other social media, there are pictures that are depicting people as being too close, and then people kind of zoom in or show some alternate picture, and it provides a different perspective. And that is the point when I say it isn't your job. You, as Joe Citizen, are not trained to identify infractions of the law. You are not necessarily required to be present if the person you reported wishes to defend themselves. And you are not trained to identify extenuating circumstances. And let's be honest, if you're reporting someone, you are unlikely to engage with that person, which means you'll unlikely offer your assistance should the need arise. But it gets worse. Sometimes authority figures not only ask you to report people, but scare you into doing so. And this is where the manipulation comes in, intentional or otherwise. Cincinnati.com reported the Hamilton County prosecutor, Joe Dieters, not only authorized the sheriff to arrest people for violating the stay-at-home order, but charged them with a felony. But that's not where the manipulation comes in. Here's what he had to say on the matter. You are attempting, in my mind, as a prosecutor, to commit serious physical harm to people, and that is felonious assault. So fine. Sit your butt in jail. You can sit there and kill yourself. I don't care. But you're not going to kill my kids, and you're not going to kill my neighbor's kids. I'm done with this nonsense, so we'll see what happens. Now, this prosecutor could have simply said, if you violate the stay-at-home order, and it comes to our attention, we will have to determine if you doing so has created a risk to other people. And if so, we may be forced to arrest you and charge you accordingly. The difference in the two is that the first presents a violation as all but certain that it will A, cause serious physical harm to someone, B, kill his kids, and C, kill his neighbor's kids. That is pure manipulation and fear-mongering. And no, I don't have to be an epidemiologist or an infectious diseases expert to say that. If I go out, I might get infected, and I might not. I might infect someone else, and I might not. Mr. Dieters portrays it as inevitable, and that stokes unnecessary fear in people. Don't believe me? Go look up the words, stay at home on Twitter, or the hashtag, stay at home, all one word, and read some of the tweets. Here's a few just in case you don't feel like doing it. Only traitors encourage people to gather with guns to protest stay-at-home orders during the height of a pandemic. Here's another. All protests of stay-at-home orders are on Trump. He has asked his base to retaliate. He is 100% responsible. When they begin showing up at the hospitals, and they will, their last spoken words can be, quote, Trump 2020, as they are hooked up to the ventilators. Last one. They don't get it. Stay at home. Your life depends on it. There is no scarcity of comments like those. And the problem with the way those in authority present the issue plays a large role in how the public thinks about the problem and how they think about those who challenge the narrative or simply ignore it. It leaps from simple calls to cooperate for the public good to defining people as, quote, traitors or suggesting calls of retaliation or guarantees that people will speak their last words as they are hooked up to a ventilator. That is not a healthy society. Which leads me to my third point, create suspicion and discord. When you report someone who violates the stay-at-home orders or they're not engaging in social distancing, it diminishes your relationship with your fellow Americans. This is because Many of the calls to report people start with exaggerating the consequences, and you are most likely not getting all of the facts to find out why someone was engaged in said behavior. And, and this is very critical, you are not learning anything about that person in the process. Instead, every bias you have is firing away. Let's look at one more Twitter comment. For all you Trump-loving, pro-life, selfish fools trying to liberate your states from stay-at-home orders put in place to save lives, this is my friend's sonogram. 
Yesterday, the young father of this unborn baby girl died from coronavirus because of stupid people like you. At this point, I'm sounding awfully close to this being a defense of people protesting. While I do support the protest, and I have reservations on how we think about social distancing, that's not the argument I'm making here. The argument is that snitching is part of a vicious cycle. It ultimately creates more division, which increases the feeling that reporting is necessary. The reason for that is that it lacks boundaries. In my police officer's story, there are boundaries present. The officer is a specific person designated to find those scoff laws, and there are procedures established to ensure they treat potential violators fairly, and those procedures can offer at least partial vindication if the officer is in fact wrong. Most important, the officer has discretion to give a warning, let them go, or even offer to assist if the situation is appropriate. None of that exists with Joe Citizen. The best we have is to decide, should we snitch or should we not? But those mechanisms are not built in. There are no checks and balances to guide people. That brings us to the part of the episode where I discuss when snitching might actually be appropriate. And we do this by applying three easy-to-understand boundaries. Through obligation, imminent threat to life or limb, and a right to confront. Let's look at that first one. I'm sure someone out there is already curious. Obligation? Since when do I have one? A while back, my manager and I were having a conversation, and I mentioned that in many situations, I would not likely report a coworker. That led to the obvious question of, well, why not? And I said, that is not what I was hired to do. I am not in any kind of supervisory role, and therefore I was not hired to ensure any employees were following the law or the guidelines of the company. If I was in a supervisory role, then it would absolutely be my job. And like the officer in my previous story, I would likely have some discretion if and when to escalate that reporting. Since I am not, I have no such obligation. That, of course, generates the next obvious question. If I knew an employee was, say, embezzling funds, would I not report them? No, but that doesn't mean the proper information wouldn't find its way to the appropriate person. And I have a very hard and fast rule. I may not snitch, but I won't lie for you. The next boundary is when there's an imminent threat to life or limb. Here's a comment I made on social media that neatly makes the point. If I call authorities, it's because there is an imminent threat to life or limb and I am unable or unwilling to intervene. That comment is pretty self-explanatory, but let me offer a couple quick points. When it's possible to intervene yourself, I find that much more effective. Growing up, I was heavily picked on in junior high and initially in high school. It was well known that you should never report bullies to a teacher. Doing so almost always made things worse. That really puts you in the crosshairs of a bully, and even peers who weren't friends with the bully would sometimes look down upon you. It just never worked out. But if you could stand up to a bully, or someone did so on your behalf, it would dramatically have a different effect. So if I see a man wailing on a woman, chances are I will intervene, because life or limb may be at stake. If I am unable to or unwilling, then I find it very much acceptable to contact the proper authorities. The last point is a right to confront. And this one is somewhat an extension of both the first and the second boundaries. But I wanted to split it apart to make a distinct point. For my non-libertarian listeners, a common theme that you will hear from libertarians is that if you don't have a right to do something, you don't have the right to assign the task to someone else. That is, if I cannot decide to come into your home and steal your dog, I don't have the right to ask, say, the government to do so. And the point I want to make is about whistleblowers, specifically in government. Let's say you come across information that elected leaders are not being honest with the American people. You have the obligation and the right to tell the American people. And you do so because you have the right to know yourself. You have the right to not only know 
but to do something about it either by your vote or a petition. Therefore, you also have the right to ask the American people to also do something about it, again, by their vote or a petition. I include this for two reasons. First, it helps to detach people from thinking they are subjects to the government. It is an established relationship with boundary, and almost all of those boundaries exist to protect people, not government. And that is important for the second reason, which is I don't think people see the importance of being told what their government is doing even close to how they see the importance of being told what their fellow citizens are doing. And that ties back to my concern about the healthy relationship and attitudes we have with and about our fellow Americans. It's deep for sure, but we need to recognize the consequences that come with snitching to our government on our fellow Americans. We become hyper-focused on displacing the relationship between citizen and government. We transition from of the people, by the people, for the people, to something more like of some people against other people. As you listened, you may have found flaws in my thoughts. You may believe I missed some reasons for not snitching, or maybe some reasons for snitching. Maybe so. Ultimately, it's about recognizing the impact that snitching has to us and those around us. Like many actions, it doesn't occur within a vacuum. If snitching must occur, it's best done under a set of guidelines. If you think mine are incomplete, use them as a starting point to develop your own. And if you do, make sure you develop your own to limit snitching where only needed and to provide you with an objective path. That objective path needs to keep you as far removed from emotion as possible. If not, you may find yourself saying some of the very tweets I read earlier. That's harmful because it creates an emotional conflict between people and positions people to use the force of government to resolve it. That is not what our founders envisioned. That does not in any way advance liberty for you or anyone else. And that most certainly does not promote the idea that we are all in this together. Let me tie all this into the context of the coronavirus pandemic and wrap it up. Things are changing daily, sometimes hourly. What we know today is not the same as what we knew yesterday. It's not the same as what we knew a week ago, a month ago. When you report someone, when you claim that someone who wasn't engaging in social distancing killed an unborn child, you're doing it on information that may be wildly incorrect. Given how fast things have changed on what we know, there's a strong chance you are. Not to mention, many of those claims are ones that we don't have the capacity to confirm. It is of no value to seek retribution against your fellow American on information that may be incorrect or unknowable. That is every bit as harmful as the charge made against people. And it could be even worse. Disagreement is fundamental to this country. Strong disagreement goes back to our founding. But punishing people on the basis of the least amount of verifiable information is not what made this country great. Vilifying people is not what made this country great. When we engage in those behaviors and then call on government to correct them, we put ourselves in the crosshairs later when someone else is doing to us what we are doing now. We are giving power to the government that is hard, even impossible, to get back. Here's my final thought. In 1775, just as the Revolutionary War is beginning, the colonies were preventing the British Army from moving by land in Boston. Abigail and John Adams are exchanging letters which take approximately one week to reach each other. In one letter, Abigail describes a grim reality of what is happening in Boston. In response, on July 7, 1775, John Adams responds saying this, Your description of the distresses of the worthy inhabitants of Boston and the other seaport towns is enough to melt a heart of stone. Our consolation must be this, my dear, that cities may be rebuilt and a people reduced to poverty may acquire fresh property. But a constitution of government once changed from freedom can never be restored. Liberty once lost is lost forever. When the people once surrender their share in the legislature and the right of defending the limitations upon the government and resisting every encroachment upon them, they can never regain it. 
I hope you found that perspective a bit refreshing and not too deep. For my libertarian friends, I encourage you to consider how those thoughts may be of value in your next exchange with someone. For my non-libertarian friends, maybe even people who believe in the value of reporting, I hope you have something to chew on for a while. For now, let's have a bill review. But I know I'll be a law someday, at least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. I am not in any way a lawyer. What follows is not in any way legal advice and is not intended to speak in any authority on legal matters. I am only acting in the capacity of a general citizen with the ability to read and interpret a concatenation of words and render an opinion. I want to take a few moments to discuss the components of an executive order. I've chosen one I feel strongly about, but I'm not going to try to influence you to consider my point of view. Rather, I wanted to provide a direction on reading these as a layperson. In the show notes, you'll find a link to the executive orders that I mentioned. They are Executive Order 20-103, which extends Executive Order 20-87. 20-103 is very short. It's a single page. The first thing you'll notice is that it includes the introductory word, whereas. While it's not required, the whereas clause, or clauses, sometimes there are more than one, the whereas clause gives rationale for the document. In this case, it reads, whereas Executive Order 20-87 expires 14 days from March 27, 2020, unless extended. That one's pretty simple. It tells us that a previous order has an expiration date unless it is extended. The order then goes on to say this. Now, therefore, I, Ron DeSantis, as governor of Florida, by virtue of the authority vested in me by Article 4, Section 1A of the Florida Constitution, Chapter 252, Florida Statutes, and all other applicable laws, promulgate the following executive order to take effect immediately. Section 1. I hereby extend Executive Order 20-87 until April 30th, 2020, unless extended by subsequent order. Again, pretty simple. Because a previous order was coming up on its expiration date, the governor decided to extend it. Let's look at the order the governor extended, 20-87. This order provides details on vacation rental closures. Again, we see the whereas clause. Actually, nine of them. I'm not going to read them all, but I will read two for the point that I'd like to make. The first whereas reads, Whereas, on March 1, 2020, I issued Executive Order 20-51 directing the Florida Department of Health to issue a public health emergency. Now, let's read the sixth one, which says, Whereas, Florida is experiencing an increase in individuals fleeing to Florida from out-of-state locations where shelter-in-place orders are being implemented and or community spread exist. Now, remember, I said these are reasons for the executive order. They're valuable in that they offer a reason for the executive order that you may or may not agree with. That's important because government is your government, and you should always approve of what they are doing. Part of that approval means you familiarize yourself with the documents they publish, the procedures they follow, at least the major ones. When evaluating the whereas, it's good to determine two things. One, is the statement in the clause true? You might better ask, do you agree with it? And then two, do I agree that all of the whereas clauses together justify the executive order? Or if it's a bill, you'd then ask if they justify the piece of legislation. I chose these two because one I agree with and one I do not. I agree on March 1, 2020, the governor directed the Florida Department of Health to issue a public health emergency. Whether he should have is yet another question. Whereas number six, I once agreed with, partially, but I no longer do. We are seeing an increase of individuals fleeing from the states, but now I do not. The question one must ask themselves is, after reading all of the whereas clauses, do you agree with each one and that the totality of them justifies the actions later listed in executive order? 2087 is several pages long, so I won't read it, and we're not actually discussing the content so much as we are what we should do with it. Maybe you read an executive order and you agree fully with it at the time but later decide that some things are no longer valid and that it should not be extended. If that's the case, 
then be sure to engage with your government and let them know. Maybe it's a call to the mayor or governor's office. Maybe it's an email. Maybe it's joining a demonstration. Whatever state you're listening from, I encourage you to look up the next executive order you hear about and consider these questions as you read it. That's all I have for this episode, and I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to find me on Facebook at Liberty Dad and on Twitter at DL underscore Liberty Dad. And remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people, and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time, and I'm out.